Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for a panel discussion on Egypt. Our uh, panel is titled Egypt's Presidential Elections Transition to What? Question mark. And um, we have uh, very knowledgeable, great analysts with us today. Um, Khalid Elgindi is a visiting fellow at the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. He's a board member of the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association. He previously served as an advisor to the Palestinian leadership on permanent status negotiations with Israel from 04 to 09 and was a key participant in the Annapolis negotiations launched in November 2007. Nathan Brown is a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University, and he's a non-resident senior associate at the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's the author of six well-received books on Arab politics, and his current work focuses on, well, Egypt, <laughs> and Islamist movements and their role in politics in the Arab world. He's been writing immensely these past couple days, uh, hard to even keep up with his writing. Um, Errol Jibic, our executive director at SETA DC, uh, he has served two terms as a member of Turkish parliament. He served in the, uh, as a member of the NATO parliamentary assembly, first as a member and then as the chairman of the Turkish delegation to the parliamentary assembly of Council of Europe. And myself, uh, my name is Kadir Rüstün, I work, uh, I'm the research director here at CETA-DC. Um, just a few days ahead of the presidential elections, uh, Egypt's Supreme Constitutional Court ruled that the parliament must be dissolved. It also decided that the candidacy of Ahmed Shafiq, who represents the Mubarak era, was valid. These decisions have been interpreted broadly as a power grab attempt, if not a soft coup or outright coup uh, by many analysts. Um, and as today's announcement showed, they delayed the announcement of the um, results uh, of the elections and uncertainty continues. So uh, where is Egypt headed is a question that's being asked in town uh, every day, every hour these days, uh, there's a huge discussion going on about that. I'd like to just brag about a piece we wrote uh, a while back. It's been eight months. Uh, we wrote the most likely scenario, at least for an extended transitional period, maybe the establishment of a regime of military tutelage. Officers will hold political and military powers overseeing a civil technocratic government veto me mechanisms would be established where the civilian initiative is kept in check by institutions controlled by the military. This, of course, would restrict freedoms in daily life and generally hamper civilian authority and uh, analysis continues. This is one of the three scenarios we outlined back in November 2011, and we, we named it as the most likely scenario. And, um, we also wrote even earlier than this that um, there are several different kinds of Turkish model that's being talked about and Egypt hopefully would not go for the worst kind, uh, but so far um, that seems to be the case. But anyway, I want to leave a lot of time for question, uh, question and answer period, so I ask our, our uh, presenters to limit their uh, presentation to 15, min 15 minutes maximum. Thank you very much for coming and joining us today. Thanks. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Brown. All right. Uh, oh, uh, thank you very much. Um, and a uh, note of, of, uh, uh, of admiration to all the men in the room who are choosing this day to wear neckties and jackets. I'm, I'm impressed. Um, and a word of advice, you have to be very careful when you take credit for having predicted it because the logical sense yes. is, oh, so you're the one who's really managing everything. Um, we wanted to know who was who had dreamed this up. So, uh, it's simply right. Okay, all right, okay. But you're not claiming responsibility. That's good, because it is a mess. Um, 
And um, this looks like what we've got here today, looks like it should be sort of a typical Washington event. A distant country has a presidential election, and we have a post-mortem a few days afterwards when the results are clear to map out the future. That's not what's going on here. Every single thing is confusing, and every new development makes things only more confusing. Uh, the election results are still not declared. Um, the law seems to be very, very clear. The election commission has until Saturday to declare the results, and so they just said they'll declare them Sunday. Um, so that's the kind of environment in which we're in. What I want to do um, is take refuge, I think, in a big picture, because the small details seem to change from minute to minute. And what I want to do in, 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 in my time is sort of give some brief remarks about kind of, kind of the nature of the Egyptian political system as I see it, as I saw it under the Mubarak years, how the revolution changed things, then go on and talk about the sort of the current uncertainties, why, what's uncertain, and then take a little look forward. So let me begin with um, the historical look. What was the Egyptian state and political system like under Mubarak? It was, without question, an authoritarian regime. But there were various different kinds of authoritarianism, and there was something distinctive about the pattern that had emerged in, under Mubarak's uh, three decades as, as, as president. This was not uh, uh, anything comparable to, um, uh, um, uh, say, Saddam Hussein's Iraq or, or Syria or anything like this. This was a very different kind of authoritarianism. I mean, as I see it, essentially what the Egyptian state was during this period was a series of little fiefdoms in which the president usually would have each of these fiefdoms controlled by a loyal figure. Um, the judiciary, Al-Azhar, uh, uh, national press, um, parliament, uh, uh, and so forth and so on. Um, but within that, um, this, the, 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 the institution has some significant degree of autonomy. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a system in which when push came to shove, the president could get what he wanted. All lines of authority went to the presidency, but push didn't necessarily come to shove on a day-to-day day -day basis. Um, and the other aspect of this was that there was actual considerable room for political debate. There was an independent press that arose in the a decade before uh, Mubarak fell. Uh, there was uh, a considerable amount of independent social organization, uh, uh, NGO life, charitable life, and so forth and so on. A society that could do an awful lot in terms of organizing itself, and sometimes people who could do an awful lot in terms of, of speaking but you couldn't do anything in politics that was organized. That was kind of the red line. So and that was why the Muslim Brotherhood was such a threat to the system, because it kept on trying to cross the line, organize in society, and cross into the political realm. And every time they did that, they wound up in jail. Um, I, I, and that's a very, very kind of schematic and rough look, but that's essentially what happened. Now, how did the revolution change that? Well, the first thing it did was take out the presidency as this controlling political actor. So you've got all these strong institutions that no longer have some, that something telling them what to do. The military, the SCAF, to some extent filled that role, but it didn't fill it as easily or with even any kind of coherent vision itself on, on how to manage things. So all of a sudden you have institutions that are marching off on their own. A second thing that was beginning to happen and only beginning to happen, I think, was change within each of those institutions, what I call kind of a mini-revolution, where you have younger <laughs> generations sometimes within some of these institutions putting pressure on what they saw as the leadership. Most of these institutions, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the press, whether it's the Lazar, maintained their old leaders. For instance, the Sheikh al Lazar was somebody who used to be a member of the Policies Committee of the National Democratic Party. He still got his job. But there's this pressure within the institution, within al Lazar, essentially on, on, a, on a contest within it. You could say the same thing about the press, the judiciary, and, 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 and so on. And, and it became possible to cross that line from social organization to political practice. The Brotherhood did that uh, very, with, with, you know, because they've been preparing for this moment for quite some time. And as, 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 as the uh, Salafis watched the Brotherhood do it, they decided to get into the act as well. So a group that had remained outside of politics but very much present in Egyptian society suddenly established a political presence. And so an awful lot of the... Uh, um, um, Chaotic environment comes, I think, from the, the from, from the fact that you've got kind of the state apparatus, which still very much functions, but not, not necessarily coherently. Which you have all these new political voices and political forces heard, and no established rules of the game for them to uh, uh, for them for them to cooperate. And this gap having a basic role, at first a very very strong role, but as I see it, actually a fairly declining one until basically the last couple of weeks. When it uh, when, when the system began unstuck, and in my mind the SCAF may have uh, panicked 
and, and reasserted control in a way that was in, in some ways even more marked than they did a year ago, February. Where we are right now, and I'll just sort of focus on the current moment, we've got two enormous uncertainties that are out there that I think will really shape how things go forward. And again, in a very legalistic environment, they're both in the hands of essentially the legal and judicial body. One is the presidential election. Who is going to be declared president? We do not know. I don't know a lot of people think they know who won the popular vote, but, but the Presidential Election Commission has not declared this. Um, um, and anything at this point is possible. And this is the, this Presidential Election Commission is a judicial body, chaired by Farouk Sultan, the chairman of the, of the Constitutional Court. The second is Constitution writing. Um, this is kind of the, the, the long-term political game. There is an assembly that is that was elected by the parliament that was declared unconstitutional that actually has met and has begun work. Uh, but there is a challenge, and a fairly serious legal challenge to its continued existence. If it does continue to exist, then we have some semblance of the old transition plan still going forward. If it is declared illegal, as is quite possible, and if I were to bet, I'd probably bet it would be declared illegal, um, um, then you have the SCAF coming in and appointing its own constitution writing body and a different set of procedures that, that, that come in that essentially mean for much more heavily uh, military managed long term transition. So let me kind of kind of now uh, um, uh, take this kind of critical turning point and look a little bit to the future. If you, there are two possibilities for the presidential election, well. My, my rule of thumb is, in, in Egypt, what I say is, you write down all the logical possibilities and you are sure that what will happen is not on that list, okay? But it looks like there are two possibilities, um, um, and that is Ahmed Shafiq will be declared the winner, or Mohamed Morsi will be declared the winner. If Shafiq is declared the winner, then what I think you would be witnessing would be an attempt by the old state apparatus to re resurrect itself in full form, um, uh, even with a former Air Force uh, general at, at the head. Um, it is not clear to me that that project can work because the political environment has changed. We no longer, I'm not sure we'll necessarily see a full reversion to the huge demonstrations of January and February of, uh, of 2011, but we see a society that is far more organized, far more articulate, and far more practiced in the art of political contestation than it was a year and a half ago, and which, as I say, the institutions themselves of the Egyptian state are a little bit shaky, or a little bit, some of them are in turmoil themselves. So I wouldn't be necessarily use a return to kind of full Mubarakism, but you will see an attempt to kind of move back in that direction, and I'm just not quite sure how far it can go, um, and how confrontation, uh, what kind of confrontation would come as a result. The second possibility is that Mohamed Morsi is declared uh, uh, victor. Um, and, um, and then you will have an extremely unsteady balance, because you will have a president who is from the Muslim Brotherhood without basically any kind of, uh, without any kind of parliament, and in a system that is still kind of hardwired to have the presidency have an awful lot of power. On the other hand, you will have a military that um, has retained an awful lot of residual power and that has an awful lot of um, kind of tricks in its back pocket that it can have to ensure that it plays a supervisor role in the political system you will have the two sides pulling the country in very, very different directions. How will they react? The real question to me is whether the Brotherhood essentially tries to work within that system. I think their inclination is clear. Their inclination is to say, this is horribly unfair. We had a parliament, you took it away from us. We won the presidency, then you took away half its powers. Um, you're cheating us, we do not accept this. The question is, what do they mean when we, say we do not accept it? The Brotherhood gives two kinds of signals. For instance, on the Parliament, they say, this, the Parliament is not legally dissolved. We are going to convene the Parliament, which would be an extremely confrontational step. On the other hand, they say, the Parliament is dissolved, and therefore we are going to go to court to overturn this, which would be about as cooperative a step as they could take, filing a lawsuit and losing. Um, um, we don't know which path the Brotherhood would take. But, Almost anybody I know who has studied the Brotherhood over the past 10 years or so expects them to uh, essentially to play a game of chicken and to blink first, to try and basically show their strength, but ultimately go along with the process. And the reason is very clear. Um, number one, they have something. For the first time really in their history, they have a, a share of political power. 
uh, in the presidency. Um, uh, again, this is all based on the uh, Morrissey winning uh, scenario. Second, when you talk to leaders of the Brotherhood, what you get is an extremely strong sense of loyalty to the organization. And I think their attitude is something like this. The Brotherhood is an extremely successful organization on which the Egyptian people need right now, and which in a sense we have inherited from the founding generation. It is our duty to make sure this organization survives in the next generation. And to launch a full confrontation, even if justice and right are on our side, even although it will throw Egyptian society into turmoil, and it could endanger the health of the organization, and we could wind up basically with the same kind of situation that is listed under NASA, with us all in jail or fleeing the country and, and pushed underground, we pick the first path. Gradual change is always a brotherly way. That's what most people expect. Um, and that's if I had to bet would be what I would expect as well. But we are then in a, a situation in which you would have very, I think, very kind of confrontational and edgy day-to-day -day politics between the military and the Brotherhood all around the, uh, I, I, I compared it earlier today in the conversation I was having, to the uh, ceasefire between uh, Hamas and Israel. Right? Um, there's an implicitly negotiated ceasefire between those two, but every day or every other day there's a rocket that gets attacked, uh, that gets launched at a right across the border and that sort of thing. An extremely edgy political environment, which is certainly not a healthy environment for designing a long-term political system, where everybody's short. I mean, the, the whole the whole problem of this entire process has been everybody's short-term focus, and it invites a very much concentration, a, 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 an overly health, an over an unhealthy concentration on very very short-term tactical uh, issues rather than the long-term task of um, of uh, reconstructing uh, uh, a healthy pluralistic uh, political system. So it's a scenario that sounds a little bit more pleasant, perhaps, everybody agrees to get along, but um, I think may have um, uh, still deliver some um, problems for Egypt in terms of its uh, long-term political reconstruction. Thank you. Mr. Algin. It's always difficult to follow Nathan Brown. Um, uh, I want to focus uh, on, on three areas that I, I, I think are uh, on the minds of a lot of people here in Washington uh, with regard to what's happened in Egypt. Uh, just a, a very quick overview uh, in very broad strokes uh, of, uh, on the, uh, the latest developments. Uh, I'll try not to overlap too much with what Nathan, Nathan's already said. Um, and then I want to uh, look a little bit at Egypt's foreign policy, uh, how it may have changed or not have changed. And, and lastly, to focus in on, on U.S.-Egyptian uh, relations and, and, and how uh, that relationship is being affected by uh, current events. Um, as far as the latest developments, obviously, I think most people are aware um, uh, there's a great deal of instability and uncertainty. Um, at each new development in this transition, we find more uncertainty and more instability. I feel like it's, uh, it's you know, Egyptians, uh, the transition was supposed to be uh, to dig out of a hole, uh, so to speak, but instead they just keep digging uh, deeper and deeper into the ground. Um, in my view, the cumulative uh, result of the events of the last several weeks, um, and most particularly uh, in the last uh, week or so, uh, does amount essentially to a, a naked power grab uh, on the part of the scam. I think they have, uh, they have manipulated the political and legal environment um, not always very successfully, but it, their attempts at manipulating have been a very have been very destabilizing. Of course, um, we've seen flare-ups uh, throughout the last 18 months. We've seen evidence of that kind of instability. Um, I think uh, it has also been a, despite the uncertainty, I think it's also been a, a, a clarifying moment. Um, people had questions: Is the scaf capable of midwifing uh, uh, an Egyptian democracy? I think we now know the answer is absolutely not. Um, in, in my view, it, this was always the case, but I think it's become clearer. Um, this was never really an actual revolution. It was a, a regime-managed transition uh, based on very, very minimal reforms. Um, perhaps the revolution is, is, uh, is yet to happen. Perhaps it won't. Um, but it certainly doesn't amount to a change of the regime. 
Um, and, and it's always been that way. Um, politically, the, uh, when you look at what's happened, it is a very, from a, from a political standpoint, it is a very serious matter to overturn the uh, results of a democratic election. Um, and especially after the parliament's been seated, um, and on what everyone generally agrees is a uh, is a technicality, there were ways to avoid such a wholesale kind of uh, eliminating, eviscerating the parliament altogether. If, if one third of them were elected unconstitutionally, then one third of them could have uh, stood to be reelected while while not doing away with the entire institution. Um, I think what what all of this has done is. I mean, it's a very cynical exercise, I think, and it's, um, I think that it's, and it speaks to the degree to which the SCAF um, uh, and the very state fiefdoms that are still in operation, more or less in the service of the SCAF, uh, uh, are detached from, uh, from the general public. Um, so obviously there's a great deal of anxiety uh, in Egypt, of frustration, exhaustion, uh, confusion, um, there is certainly protest fatigue, but I think there is also uh, elections fatigue. Uh, at each stage of elections, we've seen the turnout go down. Um, uh, I'm not sure about the last, uh, we don't have formal numbers for, for the last one, presidential uh, elections, but um, in any case, I think the most tragic outcome is really the loss of faith, uh, Egyptians' loss of faith in, uh, in their institutions, even institutions that they held in high regard before January 25th, 2011, like the judiciary. Um, that has now um, uh, been, been taken from them as well, uh, in addition to, obviously, the uh, elimination of, uh, of a newly uh, established and freely elected parliament. I think it will be very hard for Egyptians to have confidence in any future uh, institutions that they will be on solid uh, ground. Uh, and all of that, of course, adds to uh, to the insecurity and instability. Um, now, turning now to to, uh, uh, to Egypt's foreign policy, I think it's it's a little bit uh, maybe paradoxical, but it's it's a little bit the opposite. Despite all of the uncertainty and chaos of the domestic scene, um, I think we've seen a great deal of continuity as far as Egypt's foreign policy, and that, of course, is is not by coincidence, very much by design. Um, there are basically three reasons that I would point to for that, and that is that the same people who were uh, in control of foreign policy and national security policy in particular uh, are still in control today and are likely to be in control even after the quote-unquote handover um, to civilian rule, and that is the, the security uh, military intelligence uh, apparatus um, writ large. <coughs> Another reason is that you have generally a broad political consensus on on most foreign policy issues. There's not a lot of debate, uh, whether it's on Palestine or on uh, on the role that Egypt should play regionally or in Africa, for example, uh, or in relations with the West. There is fairly broad political consensus across ideological streams uh, and, and philosophies. Um, <clears throat> And the third reason is an obvious one, which is that Egypt is simply too consumed uh, with its domestic issues really to focus a lot on, uh, on foreign policy. So all of these factors, I think, work towards continuity uh, as far as uh, Egypt's regional and international posture is concerned, um, which I think is a, is a great source of relief for the United States, uh, Israel, and, uh, and others, although they clearly have anxiety about, about the future. Um, uh, two things that that means, I think, is you know, first, uh, we are likely to see Egypt continue to uphold the peace treaty. I think this is clear, the peace treaty with Israel, I don't think, uh, is in any jeopardy. Uh, the SCAF has, has said that they would uh, uh, uphold it, uh, as have almost all major political parties. So I don't think there is a, there's a real issue there. And there, again, there's consensus on maintaining the peace treaty with Israel, but seeking some kind of changes, some sort of um, balance, uh, if you will. Uh, the other thing that, that, uh, we're, uh, that I think we can say with a fair amount of certainty about the, the near term is that Egypt, the hope that Egypt would play a prominent role in the region, 
playing this, uh, uh, resume the role of being the leader of the Arab world, I think all of that clearly is going to have to wait. Um, Egypt simply doesn't have uh, the wherewithal uh, uh, to, to focus on, uh, on an ambitious foreign policy agenda. So as far as the United States, I think the latest events uh, very much do put the onus on, uh, on the United States, primarily because it is the, uh, the main benefactor, um, the staff's main uh, benefactor, and uh, an underwriter in a sense uh, as well. Um, uh, the Obama administration has taken a relatively tough line uh, with the latest developments. Uh, there have been hints at cutting off uh, Egypt's aid package. Um, certainly, that is, uh, there's a lot of talk uh, in that regard uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, there are all kinds of conditions being attached to Egypt's, uh, both the military and the civilian aid. Um, on the other hand, we have, you know, despite this you know, kind of rhetorical uh, toughness that we've seen from Hillary Clinton or Canada and others, uh, what we haven't seen really is uh, any indication that they're prepared to back this up with any meaningful action. There hasn't been any, any consequence yet. Um, and I would argue that we're not likely to. I think, um, although there is talk of aid conditionality, I think aid conditionality is, uh, uh, is a very is of limited uh, value, and I think it's also a double-edged sword. I think it's something that can very easily backfire, and we see that in, in Pakistan, where um, uh, repeated threats to cut aid um, have. Uh, it's a matter of national pride, uh, certainly in Pakistan, but also in Egypt, and uh, and you have even Egyptians saying, "Well, you know, you can keep your you can keep your assistance." Anyway, but I think more importantly, Egypt's military aid package in particular is a strategic, this is a mutual benefit. It's not an altruistic exercise. This is not because the United States um, uh, loves Egyptians. Uh, I'm not saying that they don't love Egyptians. I'm saying it's, <laughs> aid package is not because they love Egyptians. It's, it's because it serves a strategic purpose, uh, going back to, uh, to the peace treaty with Israel. Uh, and the strategic partnership that's developed since then on a wide range of issues from counterterrorism um, to the so-called Middle East peace process and, and other issues. Um, but I would argue, actually, that the United States is uh, aware uh, and probably content with, uh, I don't think, I think individual events uh, have come as a surprise. I think the way it surprised all of us, uh, and in some cases even alarmed us. Um, the various developments over the past 18 months. But I, I, I mean, this was always intended to be a regime-managed transition as opposed to changing the regime. Um, and I think uh, when, when the administration talks about a handover of authority, first of all, that was never very clearly defined, first and foremost, by Egyptians themselves. Um, it was never really clear what they meant, uh, meant by that. Um, I mean, now, of course, we have a clear understanding of what it doesn't mean. But, but I think the military was always going to play a role beyond July 1st. That what, what's changed is that they've just been more uh, explicit uh, than they have in the past. But most of what they've been trying to nudge this process has been precisely uh, that goal of retaining their their privileges uh, and and many of their powers, as well as their involvement in key uh, political and <coughs> policy areas, that also affect uh, governance. And I think the, the administration was generally, by and large, okay with that. Um, I think a, a, a real dismantling of the regime creates a lot more uncertainty than uh, than Washington is prepared to countenance right now. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, I'll just end uh, with the, with one final point, and that is um, again along the along this same theme of more continuity than change. There are obviously uh, growing strains in the relationship between the United States and, and Egypt, and I think the latest events don't uh, don't help. There's a kind of uh, a brinksmanship that's being played. Uh, by the by, the Egyptians and and by the Americans in terms of threatening the aid, 
Um, but it, what, it's not really something new. I think this, uh, this, this, this change in the U.S.-Egypt relationship began even well before the, uh, the uprising last year. Um, what, what recent events, and by recent in the last 18 months, uh, have done is to accelerate that process. Um, accelerate the process of, of, uh, of what is essentially a kind of divorce or a re realignment of the relationship uh, between uh, Egypt and the United States. I don't think either side is prepared to abandon the strategic uh, partnership, but there are voices on both sides calling for that. Thank you, Mr. Jimmy. Thank you very much. <coughs> The great level of uncertainty in Egypt and the conflicting news from within regarding the, how the results of the presidential elections will officially be announced really makes it hard to make informed comments on a number of crucial issues. Yet we have enough at hand to speak on some of the systemic issues that shape where the nation uh, when the transitions are going to evolve. I, I need you to tell you at the beginning that I'm not an, an Egypt expert, as our, our other guests are, uh, but my readings, my observations, and my comments is mostly somebody who has gone through a very similar process and has a, an intimate knowledge of the Turkish experience, and I will make some observations at the beginning uh, using what I have known. In, in my judgment, staff has never and does not currently interrupt, in, interpret the Egyptian revolution as the collapse of the existing system, but rather a reconfiguration, just a mere reconfiguration to the ejection of the Mubarak. In the meantime, the Egyptian revolutionaries have been portrayed as troublemakers causing instability and chaos. This percep perception becomes stronger and stronger over time as the revolutionary moment of last February did not turn into a revolutionary wave against the establishment of, of a military judiciary tutelage system. At certain critical junctures, the opposition groups, the biggest of them are uh, being the, the Brotherhood, choose to accommodate rather than confront the SCAF's moves, uh, the dissolution of the Constitutional Assembly, cancellation of the, the Hayrat Shatter's candidacy, as the SCAF becomes bolder over time in the absence of serious internal and outside pressures, the military leaders felt that they could shape the outcomes, and with its most recent moves to dissolve the parliament, allow Shafiq to run and compose the new Constitutional Assembly, the staff practically rendered the elected president powerless in many ways, and it remains to be seen whether the Brotherhood can change this or not. In the process, the Brotherhood has been presented with the challenge to emerge as a serious political actor, and it has had limited success in doing so. More importantly, it has not been able to garner the broad support that is crucially needed to push back against a tutelary re, uh, regime. This is partly understandable given, given the, the Brotherhood's history, as uh, Nathan Brown has said, and complicated relationship it has had with the political institutions in Egypt. I think they understood better today the extent to which establishment might go to preserve its privileges while outsourcing, maybe in the future, the potential economic and political failures to the civilian government, if any, is established in the future. So far, the military's concerns are focused more on retaining its privileged positions rather than on a certain ideology. It seeks guarantees for those privileges, basically, and actually no serious civilian actor can really deliver them what they want. But this can change, that currently only focusing their privileges can change, and the military can adapt, actually, a more anti-Islamist and ideologically driven language 
as the brotherhood or anybody else cannot offer the privileges or the tutelage system that the staff wants at this point. In the Camp David order, Mubarak functioned as an observer of the dissatisfaction with Israel and the West. Whatever that was coming out of the ordinary masses in the population, uh, President Mubarak was the, the, the one who absorbed all of this. In his absence, the military is more directly confronted with the people, and this might have serious implication for the civil and military relations in the country. And as the civilian forces ask serious questions in the future about Egypt's foreign policy, SCAF will have a harder time pursuing or endorsing the Camp David status quo policies. From the Turkish experience in the past, the Turkish military acted outside the civilian authority to the extent that it struck strategic relations with other countries and the uh, basically made very important security decisions. So we are very familiar with this system. Uh, although it is no longer possible in Turkey, the Egypt, if Egypt can transition to truly civilian role in the medium and long term, that will have consequences for its foreign policy because that is what we have known from the Turkish experience. There are great differences between the Turkish experience and the Egyptian, but there are incidents that I can make one-to-one -one, one -to -one matches. Look at the jargon. In Egypt, what is used uh, after, a, the, as in, almost everybody agrees, that the first free and fair elections, and these are, I'm using relative terms, uh, the parliament was elected. And instead of there was a winner in the parliament, the jargon was the parliament was controlled. Now, in any other country in the Western world, if a political party gets a majority in the parliament, it is announced as the winner of that elections. But in Egypt, that a political party was controlling the 